I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to another episode of Purple Roads. I'm so glad you're here with me. Today, we've got a guest who's been a puppeteer for over 25 years. Can't wait to bring him on. But before we do that, I want to thank our sponsor, Infusion HF70. They have been such a wonderful sponsor for this show, and we thank them so much. This week, we've got Victor Yared. He has been a puppeteer with the Muppets, Bear in the Big Blue House, Dark Crystal, and so many other um, wonderful shows. I can't wait to talk to him. So, Victor, how are you? Hey, what's happening, Carrie? What's going on? I'm good, man. Thank you for uh, having me on. Very kind of you. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm so fascinated by this. You know, this is, uh, as you know, I was in the in the big purple costume for all these years, and I yeah. worked with some puppeteers. But it's it's a uh, something I don't know as much about, and it is so um, the technique in it, the work you all do is so interesting. We have some things in common um, when it comes to some of the lip sync and the aspects we do. So, what I want to know to start off with is, how did you get into puppeteering? Well, you know, it's funny, I, I actually, um, one of my very first jobs was doing the uh, same thing uh, that you were doing at a much uh, lower level. <laughs> I used to do a walk around Cookie Monster for Sesame Street. Oh, wow. And it was one of my first uh, gigs in, uh, as a performer. And I used to do like little appearances and, and eventually would like fly around to conventions and things like that. Uh-huh. And I loved it, man. I thought it was like a blast. Uh, but my real start was in music. I was a classical percussion major at the uh, Curtis Institute of Music. So, so I played percussion with orchestras, and I played with the Philadelphia Opera Orchestra, and I toured around with a chamber orchestra in Japan for a little bit. Oh, wow. And um, I really just wanted to try other stuff. I kind of, you know, when, when you get out of college, I remember this really distinct moment where I had just gone on tour, with this chamber orchestra and I came back from Japan and I was in Philadelphia where I went to school and sitting in this park called Rittenhouse Square. And it was the first time in my life that I didn't have like another job or a class to study for. Like I really, I had nothing. And I was like, oh, I guess uh, I'm starting my life now. Like, <laughs> like what, what are you supposed to do? You know? Right. So, so that was the first time I really started thinking about, you know, okay, I've got my degree, I've got all this, like, is this really what I want to do? And I kind of wanted to try other stuff. I mean, I love percussion, mm -hmm. but you do spend a lot of time sitting at the back of the orchestra counting rests. And mm -hmm. and I loved that life, and I felt like I'd really fully experienced that. Um, and I just wanted to try other stuff. So I started taking acting classes and eventually voiceover classes. And I got an internship in the music department at Sesame Street because I wanted to write uh, songs for him. I wanted to write uh, children's music. And that's really how I kind of stumbled upon puppetry and that whole world that uh, Jim Henson had created. It's fascinating. Each week when we do this show, I learned there's uh, similar career paths because I was a piano player in college in uh, Waco, Texas. Yeah, no and, and got out of that thinking I was going to be a musician and I was going to have a career in that. And I stumbled into to finding out about Barney and, and going that route. And it, it's funny because I think the music really is important. It helps you with the rhythm. 100%. It's To me, it's really all, you know, it's all the same kind of thing. It's just different mediums um, that you're performing in. But I use my um, music degree very specifically, like in, in kids' shows where you're, um, you know, having to sing songs and learn music and all those tools are great. But also in um, in a less direct way, as you're saying, with just like the rhythm of scenes and everything and, and being able to listen and hear what somebody's saying, but also do your thing at the same time. Like it's a real ensemble thing um, that I definitely learned um, from playing in orchestras. You know, you learn about the sonority of the orchestra. And as a percussionist, you try really hard not to break that sonority. And, um, and it's the same thing, um, really, when, when doing scenes as an actor or as a puppeteer. Um, you're just part of this, um, 
sort of uh, hive mind, you know, of, of the scene that's happening and, and trying to really be in it and, and be active at the same time. Yeah, you've had such an interesting career because in the, in the world that you're in, you've done both. You've done kids' shows, but then you've also done a lot of adult shows um, with Crank Anchors and some of the other things that you've done. Um, I thought it was interesting, because we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, that a lot of times this is your voice when you're doing, you are the voice of, of the, the puppet. But right. on Crank Anchors, it's not. So you're actually having to do lip sync like I had to do. What have you found the challenges of doing lip syncing with a puppet? Right, right. So, you know, nine, I'd say 95% of the time, I get hired mostly for, for my voices, for doing uh, character voices and, and that stuff that goes along with the puppetry. Right. But Crank Anchors is one of those few that's that's a lip sync show. And in this case, it's all pre-recorded. <laughs> uh, so, so what's really tough of, about it is they give you these uh, three or four minute tracks that you have to learn. And it's these celebrities that made these crank calls. Um, and you're lip syncing either to the the caller or the mark, the person that they okay. called. But because it's um, you know real human conversation and spontaneous, there's a lot of pauses and ums and <clears throat> clearing of the throat, and you have to lip sync to and reenact all this stuff. And the real challenge is that while you're doing that, there's always action. Like they want you to go pick up this brush while you're saying this line, and then you brush your hair, and then you look in the mirror, but you have to be doing the scene at the same time so you really have to know these calls like like cold. Um, you can't fake your way through them. Um, you know, the first time you hear a call, I could put my hand up and kind of almost lip sync to it. It'd be a little right. bit behind and kind of chasing it. But that doesn't really work um, when we do the actual show and you've got to deal with props and blocking and all that stuff. So the hardest part is just the homework. You know, we sit down for two, three hours a night, the day before shooting two days before shooting and, and then reviewing it the day before and and really like studying these calls. Um, so for me, my process was like basically three days ahead of time is when I'd start learning the call. And then two days before I'd be, I'd be practicing it and also learning my next call that was three days ahead. And then the day before I've got three calls going and at some point your brain just like, <laughs> you know, you, you, you just can't, you can't uh, take it all in anymore. Right. But it's certainly a challenge. Now, what about, so on Barney, were they, would you get to hear stuff ahead of time? Did they uh, do it live a lot of times? Like, how were you going along with the track there? So, um, Monday would be our rehearsal day with the, with the out, of, out of costumes, with the costumes, and the, I mean, with the kids. The kids on the, on the show knew there was people in the costumes. All the extras never met any of us. So we would do rehearsals on Monday with directors and producers and choreographers. And the um, voice actors would be there reading the lines. And so, you know, I'm kind of go through in my head a little bit, getting the rhythm down. Right. Um, but when we do the songs, the singing and the dancing, the kids are recorded. And, and so are the dinosaurs, but they have live mics. So if I decide to do a jump or they decide to add a, oh boy, we can add on we can improvise on right. that song so you know that takes a lot of practice and, and i was thinking about when you were saying it's like rubbing your tummy and patting your head and chewing gum right it's 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 tricky <laughs> you have to kind of be able to do so many different things at the same time well and then you were doing all that dancing as well yeah yes yeah that was a, a whole other challenge and of course then we've got kids that you hope they hit their mark and you hope they're in in right. the place because you know my vision is is limited to say the least yeah. i was i always told people i have spidey senses because uh -huh. i had to use my my vision and smell and everything to not well, like, knock someone over right and like i said you know when i started out doing um cookie monster the walk around cookie monster was a very similar sort of a thing but then later in my puppetry career, um, like I got to work on the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance and I was doing a Skeksis. Um, I did the Ritual Master okay. and that's a whole different uh, ball game because you've actually got um, a monitor inside that's showing you not only the two different camera points of view, but also there's an overhead camera so you can kind of see the lay of the land a little bit. So that's, a, that's um, 
for me um, a much more comfortable uh, way to perform because uh, you're not as blind and you know you you're really playing to camera um, in the in a very similar way that we do with the hand puppets because when we do the hand puppets um, you know we've always got a monitor showing us exactly what the camera sees so we can play the eye lines directly to camera or off to another you know puppet or or whatever the scene calls for. I'm going to go back to Crank Yankers for a second. Yeah. When you're doing all that, is it one take? Is it two takes? Is it? Oh, it's definitely not one take. I mean, <laughs> I mean there are times that, that we do it in one, you know, at the end of the day when we're in a rush and, and they've really got to get through it. Um, but, you know, to be, to be fair, most of the puppeteers on the show, because we work really hard to learn these calls, we could do a pretty decent job in one take. But we're all perfectionists, you know, and we want to get things just perfect. And there's like a, a big line where they say something loud and we wanted to throw our arms out. But the person assisting us didn't know that line was coming. So one arm went, but the other one didn't. So we always are trying to find these little subtle gestures and things that really help, you know, sell the puppet as being real. So I think we do not an exhaustive number of takes, but we do enough takes to really cover the scene mostly for our own um you know standards of performance really sure um, you know what i mean well, well yeah i do and that's what i was going to ask you do you say to them hey can i do another one <laughs> i do me me and my buddy um paul mcginnis we're the two um we're the two biggest perfectionists on the show so we're we're the ones that are always going to ask for additional takes and it's a fine line you know you want to you want to protect the work and make the scene as good as it can be and sometimes, you know, we have a bunch of different directors come in. They haven't all done puppets before. They don't always know what's possible. So sometimes you're asking for those additional takes to show them what it could be. Um, but you don't want to slow the production process down. Right. Um, and if they're, ultimately, if the director's happy, we're there to serve the director. So, you know, if you ask for another take and they say, no, we think we got it, then, you know, you say, okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I was also the lead puppeteer um, for the last uh, three seasons of it. So I was in a little bit of a more of a position, you know, to ask for takes. And I would sometimes ask for the other puppeteers because that was part of my job was to to make sure that the puppetry was what it was supposed to be. Right. Well, we were talking earlier that it took a, a, a long hiatus, but you've right. actually come back to it. Yeah, um, it was uh, 13 years or <laughs> 15 years or something like that. We None of us expected this show was going to come back. Uh, but happy to have work, you know. Well, absolutely. What's it been like? What's the differences coming back all these years? The, the puppets changed. The process well, changed. Right. So the puppets, um, the newer puppets, you know, they, they don't last. Um, they're, they're just made out of Scott foam, so they don't, they don't uh, stand the test of time. So they sure. all pretty much had to be um, rebuilt from scratch. And the new puppets are great. The, the puppet company, um, Swazzle, that built them all, did a fantastic job, so they were light and comfortable. Um, and our showrunner, uh, John Kimmel, uh, had this idea to add beeps, not just at the front of the track like you, you normally would, but also before um, before individual lines or before paragraphs started that would kind of help you uh, stay on track with the lip sync. And it was actually a really nice uh, sort of innovation um, that helped us to really nail the lip sync i think in a really solid way so that's that's a little different but besides that man it's just as hard as it was when we did it <laughs> back in the early 2000s you know it's like you know not so much time i mean it's physical and certainly sure. your arm and your shoulder and everything but that that particular show is all about just this mental gymnastics of you know learning these calls and, and doing all this other stuff while you're lip syncing and you know uh, a lot of hard work mentally on that show. The, you know, they would do it with us when we were getting ready for a new series. We would go in and they could make adjustments with the costume on inside if if there was a fan or, or a padding or something like the, that. Yeah. Do you do they do that with you on a puppet or do they ask for your input? Absolutely. And, um, you know, most of the, you know, super experienced puppeteers are always going to ask for something because nobody's hand is the same size. Some people, you know, a lot of times they'll put a little grab bar in the top of the mouth, and some people like that to hold on to, and it makes them feel really solid. Sure. Um, 
I don't like that. I like my hand to be a little more flat, and so I, I prefer when it's really packed in the, the padding up at the top. Um, so, you know, we all have our, our preferences and, and ways we like things. And so, yeah, there is there is a little bit of adjustment that happens, you know, on the day. Um, and, and even throughout the call, if it feels like it's slipping, you know, I'll ask for more padding or whatever. But fortunately, we have, um, you know, we usually have uh, wranglers, we call them puppet wranglers, that are there to pin the props and, and repair the puppets if it needs it, and also to make sure that the puppeteers are comfortable inside the puppet. And, and we had great uh, wranglers on, on crank anchors that, that really made all that stuff work, you know, it's really funny we person. we had one of uh, one of my wranglers on uh, Purple Roads last week, talking oh. about the same thing: the importance of what they do, and how oh, they support yeah. you and help you, and all the aspects of it. Oh my God, that's like your lifeline, and especially when you're inside a costume like doing CXs on the Dark Crystal. Like, you know those those folks, you know, you could only keep those puppets up for so long before you're you're exhausted because you know these are full body puppets, much like. Big Bird or Bear in the Big Blue House, where you've got your arm up over your head. Sure. Um, and so you, you can only stay in that position for so long. And these guys would like come in like a shot at the uh, at the end of a take, and you know rip open the costume and grab the head for me, and uh, really you know helped protect us and 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 really just allow us to work at a pace that it needed to be worked at for television. Um, you know it required lots and lots of takes and. And um, you needed to be able to do this costume all day, and you could only do that in short bursts. So you really needed that help from the Wranglers. And like you said, making things comfortable, you know, the first time you put it on, there's bars sticking in your back and things right. that aren't quite right. And, and making those little adjustments, just a little bit of padding in the right place, I mean, that like saves you, you know, anguish. I can't sure. really imagine doing uh, Barney for so long. I'm sure you had back things and shoulder things and neck things, and, you know, just goes with the job. You know, it's funny. The one thing you you did mention that I had was it was my feet. Um, we perform. I was in that the the studio mm. jumping on concrete, not really thinking about it, and all the hops and all of that kind of stuff. And I ended up having some of the, the worst plantar fasciitis you oh, could have. Imagine. But I could go to them, and they they made all kinds of things for my feet and for that area. Um, to custom insoles and those kind of things to protect me. And those are like oversized feet, right? Like those are, do they have big dinosaur feet on Barney? I'm trying to remember. They're, so it's big dinosaur feet, but it's actually tennis shoes. Um, but in that, the that also, because we had friends, you know, I have friends that do walk around characters and things, and that messes up your gait when you walk. Yes. Even if sneakers are inside, it's not the normal motion of your of your legs when you walk. So that affects your alignment and your hips and everything i'm sure well right and so obviously there's resistance too so it's pulling you back so you're having to push through so they would actually let me go out and i'd get my own tennis shoes and my old insoles and all yeah. of that but when i first started um back in 91 it was it was bedroom slippers <laughs> they had nothing you just you know and of course you're falling out of them and it's horrible for your feet and everything but you know when you're 23 years old and you just want a job you go okay sure that works Absolutely, man that is that is where you know that is what we're all doing at that age is just trying to get into it you know absolutely well the fact that you got you're working with the the henson you know productions and in this industry i mean we weren't affiliated with henson but we all know henson and that that is you know a god in this in this industry what was it what's it like working with the jim henson company working with the muppets that you've done well you know the henson company's really been the gold standard for a long long time and um you know i i i came into it um i actually got a job after sesame street i got a job in the muppet workshop where they build all the puppets and I'm, i wasn't a builder or anything i just did like administrative work answering the phones and fixing computers and doing whatever so I was just trying to be a part of that company in any way I could and my first job puppeteering for them uh, was doing Sweetums I used to do another walk around character I used to do Sweetums appearances um, in and around New York City and eventually I got to do them on the Family Feud which was really cool <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, that first, those first couple of jobs doing Sweetums, I worked on Bear in the Big Blue House a little bit. And, you know, it was like, 
you know, that's the dream. I mean, as a puppeteer, that's, you know, there's, there's no bigger company, um, you know, and, and there's no company that's been as committed to doing puppet projects for as long. So, you know, you just feel, you just feel lucky and you feel, um, pressure to do a good job in those, in those early days. So you can kind of, you know, work your way up the ranks and get to do character voices and things like that. Because when you start out, you know, you're mostly assisting. You're doing right hands and assisting other puppeteers or, you know, feet or, you know, uh, you're, you're still, you're kind of um, an apprentice for, for a little while until you, you know, get to start to do uh, real character stuff. But the main thing is that they really treat their puppeteers like talent, you know. Um, I've worked on everything from big budget you know, feature films to little tiny webisodes, and you get treated differently by different people. Not always bad, but right. you know, sometimes on a movie, you know, you're just, you know, you're just the guy that moves the octopus tentacles. So they're right. they're not they don't view you as a performer. They're just like you know, so you you go sit over in that corner, and we'll call you when we get to the octopus tentacles. You know what I mean? Right. Sure. With Jim Henson Company, um, no matter what the show is because of their history and because of what they do, um, they really, you know, take care of their performers and, and, and it's something that, you know, I've always been super aware of and grateful for, especially when you work on those other shows where they're, where they don't, you know, quite treat you that way. And it's not that you need like a trailer and, you know, special food and like fancy stuff, just sure. like that they get that, oh, you, you're getting a script, you're learning lines, you're a performer, you know, right. you're an actor. So it's it, that that's one of the nice things about working for them. What was the first real character of the Muppets that you got to do? Well, the first real puppet character I think that I did was not for the Muppets. I actually okay. when I first moved up to New York City, I was driving a van the same time as I had my internship at Sesame Street, I was driving a van for this shopping network called Q2. Okay. And it was supposed to be it was QVC's like second channel and it was supposed to be like a more upscale version of QVC. So they had like a four camera shoot and it was live TV. And so I pitched them an idea to put a puppet on their kids show. They had, they had it, it, not a kids show, but they sold like kids products like toys. Sure. So I said, you know, the puppet won't sell the toys, but like I'll play with them and I'll talk about them and, and they'll just be fun and, and enjoy, you know, bring the, the sort of kid aspect to it. Sure. It wasn't, it wasn't a show for kids to watch. It was for, for parents to watch, but but it just kind of made the connection, I think, for the parents, like what these toys really were. Sure. And so that was that was my first real gig, you know, doing voices. And, and because it was early days of that of that channel, you know, I wrote a lot of the stuff and I and I worked with my friend Tom Spina um of spina designs who who uh had built the puppet and he and i would come up with little bits and things and and so we ended up doing like 300 live shows um for them and that was the very first wow. um that was the very first i think tv puppet uh puppet gig that i had and probably was last, man they were like kids in a candy shop you know yeah and i bet it was like a training ground for you absolutely and and um you know it was funny because they it was live and so there was always a preview monitor that shows you the shot that they're about to cut to. And sometimes, you know, not all the camera guys understood how the puppet thing worked. Like I would be sitting under a table and I would have the puppet up like this, but you know, you're not meant to see below the puppet's waist. Well, some of the guys would shoot wider because, you know, they were new to it. They didn't know what they were doing. Right. So I would see on the preview monitor that I was in the shot <laughs> at me. And so I would just like roll out, like the puppet would just disappear. <laughs> All of a sudden, or sometimes I would, as the puppet, I would say, "Oh boy, camera A really should tighten up a little bit. This shot's probably a little too wide." You know, I was trying to like give him direction as the puppet. Um, but there were certainly there were certainly times I was caught on camera. You know, it happens. It's so funny you were doing that because obviously we would do some of that stuff too. It's, I'm curious, what did? What did the camera guys, when you started doing those kind of things, are they used to having the puppet, you know, direct them? <laughs> no, I think it was probably a surprise. <laughs> I mean, they, but, you know, I mean, look, camera job, camera operator is a really tough job. And they've got the director in their ear. Right. You know, they're, they're trying to, like, frame things like that. So half the time, I don't even know if they were really paying attention to what to what was 
what I was saying or what was going on, but uh, but certainly there was nobody ever came up to me and and uh, complained about you know about what I was saying or anything like that. I always had a great relationship with those guys because you know the camera guys, like I said before, the Wranglers are your lifeline. The camera guys are your lifeline too. I mean, yes. without them framing the shot, it's it's a real dance that happens because they set the camera at a certain height. And I put the puppet where I think it should be within sure. that height. Well, if they then dip lower, then I go lower. And if they think they're trying to see more on the puppet and, and we're not like understanding each other, sometimes they're like chasing you down or, you know, so, so it's a real kind of thing where you have to feel like let them find their shot and then I find my place within it. And, you know, sometimes you have to really work together to, to make these complicated moves look natural, you know. It's so interesting. Our camera guys from Barney and Friends actually are sports camera guys. Okay. So Texas Rangers, the Dallas Mavericks. One of them does Monday Night Football. And they were always giving me signals. You know, okay. you know like in a rehearsal or something. Hey, you might want to. Or, hey, this. Or, it's going to do this or, or that. So, because yeah. we would, we'd have four in every episode. So, it always helped. They Sometimes they'd just be giving me hand signals or they'd yell something out. But... Well, I know what you're talking about. It, it, that's great, you know, and, and generally, you know, I mean, it, it's a real collaborative art form television, and, and usually people are supportive like that, and I think what makes it difficult, puppetry, is it's very limiting for camera guys. Like, they're used to composing shots like, okay, I got a single, I got a two shot, a wide shot, whatever, but now all of a sudden, they've got to hide everything below a certain line, you know, and if they pan over here too far, well, all of a sudden we're seeing off the side of this thing, and then you're going to see below the puppet here. So all of a sudden their world gets really small. And some guys like pick it up like that, and they're like, oh, okay, I get it. This is our world, and this is right. what we see. And other people, you know, struggle with it. It's not an easy thing. Um, so you, you you feel, you know, when you get when you find camera folks that get it and get it really well, you feel super lucky and happy to have them because it makes your job so much easier. You're not trying to, having to correct framing or you know hide things last minute. It's, it's interesting that you got started doing live, uh, live TV because I got started on live tours. I did all the Barney tours and promotion for 10 years before I ever did the TV show. Yeah. And so it was such an interesting transition because I was so used to you just keep going. If you trip, if you fall, you get up and you just keep going. And then to go in the TV show and do eight takes, I had to learn how to conserve my energy because I blow it out on every, you know, and by the seventh take because, you know, a kid fell down or something, you're just, you're gassed. So I learned a lot of interesting things going from live to TV. Um, what did you learn from going from some of these different shows that you've done? Well, you know, it's a similar thing of conserving your energy with puppetry, but also, you know, there's even another level to it because we're seeing the actual picture. So, you know, if I'm doing a scene and I see my head pop into the shot, a lot of times I'll just drop the puppet, I'll, I'll bust the take, which is good and not good, right. you know? Like if, you're, if, you don't, if you don't overdo it, you know, sometimes people, puppeteers can get too precious with their work and they'll say, well, I saw a little bit too much arm rot. And the director may say, well, I don't care that we saw a little too much arm rot. You know what I mean? Right. You, you don't want to take advantage of that. But, you know, if you're like myself, you've been doing it for a long time, you have a good relationship with the directors, they trust you to to do a little bit of that um, to protect the work. Sure. Uh, so, so, yeah, I find, you know, the more experience you get with TV, the more there is really, um, you know, finding finding those things that you that you can correct. And also, you know, doing live shows, sometimes you're not thrilled with a take, but you you push through it anyway. You know, you you, you let the director make those choices as to um, whether or not it's it's good enough for for prime time, and and you know you have to kind of leave your ego at the door. Right. Bit, you know what I mean. I oh, I know. I'm smiling because I know exactly what you mean. There mm -hmm. are definitely times, and some of it with us is because we had kids in in all the scenes, so I might not be thrilled, but they might say, you know, that was the best we got with that child. Like, well, you know, we got to take that because we might be here doing another 15 takes. Well, that's that's what that's the thing. Again, you know, that line that comes with experience, you know, like 
I've done a little bit of directing and I've been around this for a long time so I know what I think looks good and how I would shoot things. So you want to contribute and make suggestions and try to make the shooting process um, good for everybody. Right. Also, um, ultimately you have to know it's the producer's show, it's the director's show, and you're a cog in the wheel. And when they say they're happy and they get what they want, then you say, great. And you move on and, and you know do the next thing. So I want to talk about voices that you do. Do does the director give you? Does the producer? Are you creating some of these voices for the, some of these different puppets, or is it a, a little bit of each, a little bit of both? Well, typically, you know, there are different projects. Like sometimes a lot of projects I'm auditioning for, so okay. I get sides, I get a script, and you'll get a character description. Sometimes you might get a picture, and then you get the dialogue. And so I usually. I, almost every audition, I have like three or four voices um, that I'm going to try out. Okay. Um, so that if they don't love one, I can quickly pivot to something else. Um, sometimes in the audition, they'll say, that's great, but we want something more natural. So I might do something that I hadn't thought of or, you know, a whole different thing. Um, and then, yeah, some, sometimes the director will, you know, work with you a little. The producers will work with you a little bit. But mostly, yeah, mostly it's it's reading that character description or, or the dialogue and just picking from a list. I, I, I keep I kept for a long time my list of like all all the voices that I thought I could do. And so I would look down my list and I would, you know, pick the ones that I thought. Well, now I kind of just know what they are because I've done it, you know, for a while. But but uh, yeah, mostly comes from from uh, the puppeteer and their sort of range that they have. And then are you doing some puppets that someone else used to do and having to recreate the voice? Um, let's see. I, I had done some of that for the Muppets. Okay. Uh, um, so I did I did uh, Miss Piggy for a while, and I did Fozzie Bear for a little bit, and Statler – or Waldorf of Statler and Waldorf. Um, but Disney was never 100% behind having – um, additional performers do these voices, so it was kind of like they, they had a backup program for a while, and then they didn't have a backup program. Um, but so I think that's the only time that I ever really um, did a character that that was had been created by somebody else. Most of the time, um, for me, it's always been like original characters, which which I love because you know you're not tied to somebody else's uh, vocal performance or that character history. You can really kind of create an original uh, character on your own, which is which is always the best and most fun thing to do. So what have been some of the fun ones that you've done? Will you, will you give us a, a little bit of a couple of them? <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, uh, when I first came out to California, one of the first characters I did was Tardy the Turtle. Okay. Tardy, Tardy was a turtle that um, was confused a lot and um, would squeak sometimes like this. And uh, I did on, uh, there's a show recently called Mutton Stuff. I did uh, Melvin the Fire Hydrant, who was like, uh, you know, it's a show with dogs and you're a fire hydrant. So you're basically getting peed on all the time. So Melvin was just kind of a pissed off sounding guy. He wasn't really pissed off. He would tell jokes. Oh, I got one for you. Um, that same show I did, Tutter the Mouse. No, not Tutter. Tutter was from Baron Big Blue House. That was Peter Woods. I, what was my mouse called? Noodles. That was what it was called. Noodles uh, was a little mouse with a high squeaky voice, I guess, to talk like this. Um, and I just did Hup, uh, the podling, on uh, Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. Hup, uh, Hup. He has like a lot of uh, gravel in his throat. And he also spoke in podling, half podling, half English. Okay. So, Hup would say, Afalavubas! Ah, apada, hop. Uh, that was Hup's voice. I don't know, man. I've done accents uh, that uh, over the years and monster voices. Uh, I did. I oh, I used to do. Well, I did do Sweetums. That's another one that I um, love. Sweetums about imitating another character's voice. I, I don't. I didn't have a great Richard Hunt uh, voice, but I did my my version of Sweetums. He was. He was kind. Of, you know, Sweetums was always that big guy. Hey guys, I want to go to Hollywood. I was chasing after the the Muppets in the Muppet movie. Um, and then on, did you do uh, was it Waldorf or did you do Statler? 
Uh, Waldorf. Uh, so yeah, so when I did that, Drew Massey did did Statler, and I did Waldorf. So so Statler would say, Drew's character would say, uh, "I wish Gene Kelly would teach me to Charleston," and then I would say, "I wish Gene Kelly would drive you to Charleston." Uh, that's an old, <laughs> old Muppet uh, Muppet Show classic. But that was only a, that was only a few years where we did those uh, those Muppet characters. That that um, backup program died out pretty fast. Um, but it was fun. It was fun to be part of that that uh, classic Muppet world for for a little bit. Well, didn't I? I think I saw uh, you did a. Were you in a Weezer video? Oh yeah, yeah. I did. Um, I did the Weezer video, um, and that was that was an interesting one um, because it was with the Muppets and and. Um, they were doing a big wide shot, and I was in the background doing one of these two penguins, and uh, and then they went in for a little closer coverage. This was pretty early in my career. Okay. And they went in for closer coverage, and they so they took me out, and they put in uh, Bruce Lenoil and Alan Troutman, um, two more seasoned puppeteers, to do these two penguins, and then they went in for a penguin close up, and they took those guys out, and they put in like Steve Whitmire or somebody to do, and I thought at that point in my career, I thought I was like, wow. I was like they take those guys out. Like I'm never gonna get a shot to do, <laughs> to do anything cool with the Muppets, um, and that's kind of true. Like it really is the main four or five guys there that do pretty much everything. So like I say, I feel like I really, in some ways, I really lucked out that they um, ended that backup program because from that point on, I pretty much have, have done original characters, um, and and you know gotten to do my own my own thing. Um, oh, there was another character in uh, Pajan a show called Pajanimals. I really love the show Pajanimals. Um, um, Squacky the Duck, I got to play. And he just sort of had, he had kind of a lisp. I guess people always give ducks a lisp. A little, a little bit Daffy Duck inspired, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, and then I did, uh, there's a character also in Pajanimals called Jerry the Bear. I talk like this. And he was a big happy bear, and he's kind of stupid, and he likes everybody. <laughs> and uh, what else? Also in that show, there were these beavers, Hank and Frank. Another stupid character. I, I do lots of stupid characters, Terry. Uh, I was Hank the beaver, and he talked like this to his partner, Frank. Um, man, I never know. You know, it's funny. Here's an interesting thing. Dialects and... Um, accents, you know. When I was younger, you know, we would do all kinds of accents and, you know, do Russian accents and German and Spanish and Italian and, um, and then, you know, it started, it was probably always uncool, but it sort of came to light that it was uncool to do accents if you weren't from that country, right? And there's still like, I don't know, if I do a Russian accent today, Somehow people don't get offended. Like that's an okay country to do, <laughs> but like if you do a, a China, you know, an Asian accent. My wife is Korean, but if I do like an Asian accent, if I did a Korean accent, like that's bad news, right? Like, right. It's offensive, and I and I never really. It was interesting. I've gone back and forth in my career. Like first, I thought I would get offended if people would do Asian accents because my wife was Korean. I like right. it would like kind of bothered me that someone. I was like, well, why is it bothering me that they're doing that accent? Like. They don't dislike my wife. Like, why does? Why do I care about that? So I thought, you know what? Then accents are fine. Like, people should do accents. And then I watched this documentary. Is it, is it called Being Apu? It's about the Apu, the Indian character on The Simpsons that Hank Azari does. Yes. It's basically just like a lesson in in kind of in race relations and why Indian people are offended by that or think like an Indian person should be doing that character. And it makes a lot of sense. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess. Uh, that's true. So I so I kind of have stopped doing accents from other countries, but I did a character in this pilot recently um, that was like a, su a southern voice. He kind of talked like this. Now look, I'm I'm from Maryland, border state, right? Yep. So there's southern people in Maryland. Is that offensive? You live in Dallas. Is it offensive to you if I talk like? Is there like? That I've been hearing that my whole life. So I <laughs> everyone does that when they're down here. Maybe it's still okay. Maybe it's still okay to do uh, dial regional dialects. I, I don't know. I don't know where the line is, but you know, ultimately, I got into this business because I wanted to on on for the kids 
kid show level, I wanted to educate and entertain and reach kids um, in a way that you can't doing um, local small theater shows. Like you can reach a really huge audience doing TV and movies and stuff. And so it was, you know, I think my beginnings were kind of altruistic and as far as that goes. And then, you know, with adult shows, just being entertaining and fun. Sure. So you never want to, you know, offend people. Comedy is one of those things where it's like, you know, everybody's offended by something, you know? And so, you know, you try to, if you, I feel like if you have a good heart and you have good intention, you will make mistakes and you'll do things you shouldn't. But I think ultimately you, you kind of veer from or correct those mistakes. And, you know, I think people are more forgiving uh, when they when they understand or, or sense that your motives are, are good, you know, good intentions. Oh, I agree 100%. I mean, I, I think it's changed a lot. You know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, you really wouldn't have been thinking about it as, as much. But now I think there's just a, a nature where everyone's a little more sensitive about things. But when they understand where you're coming from, the place you're coming from, and that it's about entertaining, inspiring, I think I think that changes things a little bit. But Yeah, and I think it's a good thing that people – I think it's a good thing that that's changing because I think, you know, the more we continue to evolve as people, as entertainers, I think, you know, that's a good thing. I think it's good for everyone, you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I always laugh because people used to make fun of our – Barney message of love and you really you guys really feel this way and you're just so lovey and so over the top and now we need that message more than ever and, and everyone's embracing I, that message I never understood you know you definitely get that in kids shows and I know that there were Barney haters out there I, I work on a show called Word Party for the Jim Henson company it's the same kind of thing you know it's like you do this show that's about these four babies that that care about each other and are learning together and like you know it's all so positive and then people are like man i i hate this stupid panda like they just there's they're like in such a rage about it and look you know whatever like you know, like i say you're you're never going to please everybody but i for one uh watched barney i was i was you know already i'm sure a teenager or, or my early 20s when that when that was on and i was very much into kids television and learning about you know these different shows and and so I watched Barney I thought it was I thought it was great I thought uh, I thought um, the message as you say was one of love and, and that's a good thing to be putting out in the world it's so much fun for me because even though I was doing that all those years I was the same way I watched uh, Sesame Street I was a huge fan of Big Bird and was lucky enough to work with Carol um, Mr. Rogers and I got to meet Mr. McFeely and I just loved Bear in the Big Blue House. I yeah. loved what, what was going on with that show. I loved the message of that show. I um, was lucky enough to, to work with Noel. And and I love, I didn't realize at first that you had worked on that show, but I just thought it was such a really well done show. I agree, yeah, Noel, Noel is, you know, that's his his warmth and his genuine humanity that, that comes out of that character. And uh, yeah, that was one of my first, uh, that was my first like ensemble uh, puppet show that I ever worked on. And so I was mostly assisting and, and like, I was doing doubling for Tyler Bunch. He, he had two characters. He had um, Trilo and he had Pop, the otter. Yeah. And so sometimes I'd do Trilo when he was doing Pop and sometimes I'd do Pop when he was doing Trilo. So it was a good um, training ground for me. Um, I mean, I, amazing training ground, really. I mean, that's one of the best, you know, kid shows that they ever, they ever made and um, and uh, and it was just great to watch those guys and, and learn from them but yeah I think the warmth of that show um, definitely um, that's Noel you know you just get that from him as a person and that was his heart that he was you know putting out there very unabashedly and, and that's kind of the magic of what we do um, as puppeteers like I never feel sappy when I have a, a puppet on and I'm talking to a kid you never feel like you know is it weird to give him a hug or to say I love you or whatever because as the puppet of course you know I'm sure inside Barney live appearances and stuff I'm sure you're mobbed by kids who just love to hug the dinosaur you know what I mean and it's such a beautiful experience to to have that love come at you um, you know and in just such huge supply and, and you just feel that they get so much out of it like meeting this 
character and person that they've loved watching and, yes. and, and look up to. And, you know, it's such a cool experience. But did you realize, because I didn't when I first got into this, they got a ton out of it. But boy, did I get a lot out of it. I the the response from the kids and how much it touched them how much they end up touching me seeing these kids especially you know a lot of a lot of kids in hospitals and things of that nature that were sick but when barney was in there they weren't they were happy and they were just hanging out with their friend and it was such an inspiring experience to see the reaction from these children yeah it, it's a wonderful thing and you know Working in TV and film, you don't get a lot of that. You know, you read like posts and things on the internet, but like, it's not till till like a kid visits the set or you know someone um, you make a little special video for someone and you know things like that um, that you get to really see that. But man, there's nothing that fills you up like that. You know, it's just such a wonderful feeling to just know that you made somebody's day better and and somebody that you never met. You know is happier because of what you did. It's great. So I had been doing Barney for about four years when I got to perform at Radio City Music Hall. And that's where I knew, hey, I think this is going to work out. And it was just a highlight for me, my first big highlight. What was the first highlight? What was the first one where you thought, oh my goodness, this is happening. Like, I think I can make a career out of this. I don't know. I'm still waiting to believe that I can make a career out of this. <laughs> 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 but okay, was there was there a movie that you worked on that you went, wow, this is pretty cool? Well, I mean, look, all that, all those early shows, you know, I thought Bear was incredible. I worked on Between the Lions. I thought that was incredible. I think probably Sesame Street. I, I only worked a couple days on Sesame Street, but being there with, you know, which the guys at that time that were the, the biggest, you know, um, names in, in puppetry, um, that, was, that was a pretty... A uh, pretty cool experience um, for me as a young puppeteer, um, but you know, it's a tough freelance performing is a tough business, as you yeah. know. And so, I've never felt like my career is going to continue past whatever job I just finished. You know, <laughs> like right. I'm always like desperately looking for when I, I can I can be out of work for about three days. That's that's as long as I can be happy. The fourth day. I become a desperate person. Like, what am I going to do with my life? I'm not working. Nobody loves me. This is terrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? I and, do. And I've been doing this for you know 27 years, and and knock wood, you know, I still am am uh, paying my bills. But it's a uh, it's a tough thing to. I know I would love to do this for my whole life. Whether or not people continue to hire me for my whole life, who knows. It's fascinating. Do you, has it has puppeteering slowed down, or has it picked up in the last several years? It's definitely picked up. I mean, it's always cyclical. You know, it always ebbs and flows. And like, and last year when I was working on Crank Anchors, so so when I was I, I was doing Dark Crystal over in London, and when I came back, all the other puppeteers were like, "Oh man, it's been so dead here," and boy were they right. We had like six six more months of like no work. And then things started to pick up and I started working on um, Crank Anchors. And wouldn't you know it, four other shows, like literally shooting the same two months, like everything happened all at once. Kidding was shooting and there's a, a, a food show that I think hasn't come out yet for Higher Ground Productions. And I know there were like two or three other things happening all, all in the same, the same uh, few weeks. And it was just like, man, can't we just spread this out a little, a little bit, so we could all work a little more? But, but yeah. So right now, I feel like there's a lot, there's a lot of things um, on TV with puppets, and and a lot of things that's still in production or coming up in production. So, so I think we're in one of those periods of, of, uh, of puppets being out there again, and hopefully it stays. You know, hopefully it stays for a while. I'm just curious. Talking to you in, in in obviously the puppeteering, but also the voice. Which is harder for you, working the puppet, coming up with the voice when you're performing? Well, um, you know, I always so when I teach puppetry, I sometimes do workshops and things like that, and I always kind of break it down into three areas. It's it's the manipulation of the puppet, okay. it's the voice work, and it's the acting. 
and of the three, the acting is really the one that's the hardest. Like that's the one that people spend the least amount of time on because I think a lot of people were fans of the Jim Henson Company or fans of the Muppets or Sesame Street and they kind of get into this world without really um, studying a whole lot. Um, and some people are just naturally great actors and maybe don't need to study a whole lot. But but for me, that's one of the skills that sort of gets neglected. So it's always about how can I create a memorable character that people are endeared to or repulsed by or whatever you're trying to do. Right. But that, you know that that is a, a fully three dimensional character that's interesting. That's that's really tough. Um, the manipulation part, I've never been great at. I mean, I I certainly have gotten comfortable with it over the years, but that's not my natural ability. So that's something that I I always have strived to improve and and um and learn as I went along. The character and the voices that that stuff has always been a little more natural for me. Um, but I, I always tell people it's the type of thing that anybody can do. Anybody can become a better manipulator. Anybody can expand their voice range. Anybody can be a better actor. It just takes time and, and you know focus on that area, really. Which project's been the hardest one? Oh, boy. Well, Crank Anchors is certainly the most difficult mentally show I've ever worked on. Um, I think the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance is probably the biggest and um, most difficult show physically um, because we would do so many takes. We would do 20 takes of this angle and 20 oh, takes of wow. another and there'd be seven different angles for each scene. And so that, um, that certainly was super taxing and um, being inside those Skeksis was, was, were really, uh, was really hard, really physical. Um, but you know, it's all relative to what I would say a real job is, which is so <laughs> sure, you know, sure, sure. You know, working in a factory or like, you know, working on a, a dock or throwing trash in the back of a trash truck. Like, sure. I mean, I get to play with dolls for a living, so I can't really, <laughs> right. really complain that it's that hard. Those are just hard, hard relative to the other things I've done. Sure, not to, like the world. You know, sure. I mean? Well, and the, but there is pressure of. You've got a, a crew and a, a cast and cameras and lights, and so you do have to kind of hit your mark. Yeah, I mean, I certainly work very hard at it. Like I say, I'm a perfectionist, and like I, I put a ton of effort into it. Right. Um, so I guess it's hard in that sense. Sure. But it's not hard in like, in the sense of you know, being a nanny or something. <laughs> you yeah, know I, I got like you. I, I just think that there's, you know, I I always feel like in any job. There, you know, you sort of, you know, you start to take it for granted and you get caught up in, oh, I wish I got to have more lines or I wish it was this. And I always at some point during the project, I remind myself, oh, yeah, I forgot I'm working in TV. Right. I'm, I'm flapping my hand and doing stupid voices. I think things are OK. Like, right. I think I'll be right. You know? Yeah, it definitely is all about perspective. Yeah. Um, what is the most unusual project you worked on? Oh, boy. That's a good question. Um, God, I just like pull up my IMDb page or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, that's that's really tough. I, I I don't know. I mean, I've I've definitely worked on some like more adult projects. Like sure. people every every uh, three days or so, somebody gets the idea. Like, wouldn't it be hilarious? Right. But show, but get this. They're cursing, and they have sex, and it's like real. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like some, it's going to be a really funny thing, and it's a really novel idea. It's not. Right. It's a novel of an idea, but sometimes it's funnier than others, and so, yeah. so I have done projects like that and been in kind of odd situations, uh, you know, as a puppeteer. Um, but I don't know. To me, it's all just work. Like it's all just part of the creative journey, you know, finding your next project and learning from the one you're on and, you know, I'm sorry, I, can't, I, I really, I can't offhand think of anything, uh, I'm sure something will come to me. Well, no, I'm thinking about like the Weezer, for example, being on a music video like that with a band, it's got to be a little bit different than your typical productions yeah, you worked um, on. 
certainly maybe that's, not. that's uh, you know, that's cool and different. But I mean, I've you know, I've had the fortune of working on a lot of things with celebrities over the years. I worked on a show called No You Shut Up, one of my favorite shows, which probably nobody has ever seen. It used to be on YouTube, and you could I would always tell people just just Google No You Shut Up season three. Um, but it was a talk show hosted by Paul F. Tompkins. And um, we would have these amazing celebrity comedians come in, like Key and Peele and um, uh, Fred, uh, um, uh, what was his name from the uh, Waiting for Guffman movies? You know who I'm talking oh, about? Uh, uh, I do. Oh, Fred Willard. Fred Willard and um, uh, Chris Parnell and like just incredible comedians would come on. So I'm, I'm, I've, been comfortable, you know, being around celebrities over the years and things like that. So, um, so the Weezer thing, uh, you know, I, I had done I had done some music videos. I had done that kind of stuff. So I guess it wasn't it wasn't all that crazy. I, I got to work on the red carpet at the Oscars. That was pretty cool. Um, as far as different experiences. So what um, did you do for that? Is what's that? What did you do for that? Right. So what's funny is I was doing this little hot dog puppet that was from <laughs> No You Shut Up. And um, and so everybody on the red carpet, whether you're a camera operator or, or interviewer or whatever, has to wear a tuxedo. So I had to get a tuxedo, even though I'm below the camera and I'm sitting on the ground on an apple box and I'm holding up this hot dog puppet who's also wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> and it was just so silly. But I'm, in, I'm interviewing like Whoopi Goldberg and um, Sasha Baron Cohen and, um, you know, uh, Lou Gossett Jr. and like just you know it was, it was a that was pretty bizarre because I thought um, you know I thought it wouldn't be that big of a deal because like I said I'd worked with celebrities before but yeah. being at the Oscars is pretty cool oh and I did think of one more that was that was a pretty surreal experience I worked on the 2010 uh, Grammy Awards okay the Jim Henson Company did a thing with a with a CeeLo Green um, forget you, his, his song "Forget You." Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, CeeLo Green, and we we rehearsed this dance thing, and I'm I'm pretty comfortable with choreography, like you say, the music background. Yeah. you know, you're comfortable with that stuff. So I learned my part. I knew what I was doing. I was like one of the three front girls that were doing the backup singing, um, lip syncing, and you know, I, I came home the night before the show, and I told my wife, I was like, yeah, you know everybody's so excited about it. Like it's, you know, it, they're, they're like people are like tweeting and putting on Facebook and she's like, yeah, it's the, it's, it's the Grammys. It's a big deal. And then I was like, Oh, I, I kind of like, it hadn't hit me until then. So then when we actually did the show, I was like, all of a sudden I was like super like focused and like, I didn't want to mess up. I was like, <laughs> like had this like really intense, you know, thing. Um, but it, the show went great. It was, it was fun and a lot of fun, but but yeah, that was that was an intense doing a live show that was going out to you know millions of people right. and, and all that stuff was uh, that was fun. That was a lot it, of fun. It's fascinating, and I'm, I'm looking at my producer here, Derek. Our world, we're used to these things because I was a purple dinosaur for 22 years. So yeah. to, to me, this is nothing, nothing strange. I remember doing uh, the Rosie O'Donnell show. All I'm focusing on is being Barney. Right, there's celebrities and, and all of this cool stuff. Yeah. But you're about to be on national TV in front of all of these people. And even I did a Macy's Day Parade. You're in front of yeah. millions and millions and millions, but you're just focusing on what you're doing. At least I'm always just focusing on the character and the performance. So you don't always get caught up on where you are, or what's happening. Well, and for you at that point, I mean, it, you know, it was such a thing that you were one with that character, I'm sure you know, getting into the zone of, uh, of what you were supposed to do was like second nature at that point. Yes. And, and I always tell, um, you know, my daughters, I have three, three little daughters as far as performing goes, um, you know, when people get nervous on stage, um, that nervous energy is the same exact energy that I have when I'm excited to perform. It's just channeling it um, by exactly what you're saying, by focusing on the task at hand by you know thinking about your lines that you're about to do or your steps or whatever your thing is that transforms that nervous energy into an excited performance you know right. so if you, you're supposed to have that energy before a live show before any show really you know whatever 
um, you're supposed to have that adrenaline rush in that thing. It's really just how your brain channels that energy, whether you're thinking about, oh, no, I hope I don't mess up, or whether you're thinking about, okay, first I do this, and then this is the next thing, and then I have to remember this part. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm dying to know, though. I got to know what the voice of the hot dog was. Uh, this is this. He oh, you like, just use your voice. <laughs> it's so great. He was just like this, except he was, uh, I mean, maybe you think I'm an idiot, but he was definitely an idiot. So he was like this, and he would be like, wow, Carrie, it is so great to be on your show. I love seeing my face. Uh, it is great to see me in camera. Hi. This is fun. I like it. That's, that's pretty much what Hot Dog was. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So what are you currently doing? Well, uh, we just wrapped up our most recent season of uh, Crank Anchors, and, uh, which was great, and uh, potentially going to be doing um, some more of that. Um, so we're waiting to, to hear uh, whether or not we get picked up for more. It's, it's sounding like we hopefully will. When will that and, air? What's that? When will that air? Um, so they aired 10 episodes already okay um, and then the next 10 that we've shot already are going to be airing i believe in the summer they said okay. they might do it earlier but i think in the summer and then i also just shot some little short uh, puppet things for um nickelodeon these these little shorts with the spongebob characters okay. um, they did puppet versions of them which were so cute um and then and then so we did a, a little series of of these spongebob shorts that are coming out and then, you know, I, um, I've been um, writing as well. Um, I just finished writing uh, four episodes of a new kid's show called Friend Space. Um, that's uh, still in production. And um, yeah, you know, I, I'm l looking for my next gig as always. <laughs> you got three days and that's when I panic. <laughs> it has been a blast having you on, Victor. No, oh, thanks, man. Thank you so much. It's it's really it's fascinating. Um, I want to finish with one thing because I thought this is this was interesting as we we're talking that you're right. I did get comfortable because I only played one character for 22 years. Mm. What is it like going from one? Do you have to kind of erase what you did and then get into the head of get your mindset for whatever the new character you're playing? Well, I think I think the trickiest thing is to not repeat yourself. You know. All of us that do voices, you know, you've got maybe four or five really super distinct voices or maybe three really super distinct voices. And then everything else is kind of a variation on that. It's the same voice with a little bit of an accent or the same voice with a little more of a guttural sound. So, and as the voices um, start to sound similar, the only thing you can really do to separate it is your perspective. It's where the acting part comes in, right? So it's like finding, yeah, you know, Hup actually sounds similar to a character I played on Sid the Science Kid called Gerald. Um, but Gerald was a little kid in a little kid's world, and Hup is a, is a podling that wants to be a paladin. So their perspective, their view of the world is, you know, like night and day, right? So those characters, even though they may sound similar, I, I don't feel like I'm repeating myself at all. Right. So that, that's really the challenge, I think, with doing... Um, different characters is just finding a fresh take and, and if you do another kid character how is he different from that last kid character if you do another podling how is he different from that last podling so it's just really reinventing your yourself a little bit each time to to find a little a little different uh, take on things well i know you got three days so i'll let you get yeah. to uh find it a gig but thank you so much for coming on it's just been a blast talking with you Ah, uh, thank you, Kerry. I really enjoyed it, man. Well, good luck to you, and uh, and hopefully we'll talk again soon. And thank you all so much for Purple Roads coming on. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. I'll see you next week. I love you guys. Take care. <laughs>